If you are listening to this video, it means I've recently become a father. So in lieu of actually appearing before you today, I have prepared this so you don't have to miss out. First up, can you hear me? I hope everyone can hear me. If not, perhaps they can adjust the volume. I'm here to talk about the Mars Industrialization Roadmap, or how to industrialize a lethal vacuum in just 400 easy steps. I'm going to cover quite a lot of material here. We're going to get into some very big ideas, so hang in there. I love this image of Gail Crater from Mars Global Surveyor. I've seen it a thousand times. You've probably seen it a thousand times. But I only just noticed this feature, a perfect river delta just above the N in industrialization. So how cool is that? Who am I? My name is Casey Hanmer. Here you can find a link to my website and the section on it. Uh, that contains uh, uh, lists of links to documents and blogs and books and so on I've written about Mars. Um, I, by training, I'm a physicist, and um, and by kind of fun, I, I, I practice in geology. Here was a picture of me at the Great Unconformity in the Grand Canyon, sort of a gap of a billion years in historic record. A couple of years ago, I helped build this Tesla coil we took to Burning Man. Uh, way back in the early years of this decade, I hitchhiked halfway across Siberia, uh, saw this statue of the Soviet worker and then completed hitchhiking to the other side of Siberia. And then before my most recent job, I, I was the levitation engineer at Hyperloop One, where I helped to build this a giant vacuum tube in the desert and, uh, and levitate the pod as we flew down there at what was then the record top speed of about 280 miles an hour. <coughs> now, um, I must state that, you know, there's a disclaimer here. Um, I'm representing myself and not my employer. And, um, and obviously I don't have a crystal ball, and so I don't know for sure how to build a city on Mars, but this actually applies to most of us. Uh, we are mostly not working on Mars settlement strategies full time, uh, and nor do we have the benefit of a time machine. Rather, we come together to share ideas and enthusiasm and then spread it like the conference flu. This talk is primarily derived from my re most recent book, uh, on industrializing Mars, which is now available on Amazon. So first up, let's think about what we mean by industrialization. And I'm going to start with a word, uh, otaki, which is not a very common word, although it is well-defined. Because the goal here is, is to think systematically about visions for the future that we all share. Now, Otaki is defined as an economic, a state of economic independence or self-sufficiency, which is a fairly simple concept. And um, it can also refer to a country, state, or society that's economically independent. And on Google Trends, it shows that despite the fact that this word first appeared in the English language in the early 17th century, it didn't really become important or commonly used until the 1930s, when the impending World War II or total war in Europe, demanded industrialization for survival. Survival in World War II depended on being able to produce the machines of war uh, faster than they were being destroyed. So really when it comes down to thinking about Mars, we need to think about it in a similar way. It's, it's about a matter of being able to produce everything that is needed there, uh, at least as quickly as it's destroyed. Now, The Martian is this image from the top right, comes from the movie The Martian. And the Martian is one of my favorite, favorite films. A very, very exciting year for me when it came out. And uh, I think it's absolutely awesome. And when we think of self sufficiency on Mars, we normally think of growing potatoes, like Mark Watney does in the film and in the book. But what would have happened to Watney without a ride home? It's actually pretty explicit if you read the book, uh, you know, that sooner or later he would have, he would have starved. Uh, but it, what if he had enough potatoes? You know, what if he had enough food? What if, what if he had enough area to, to grow more food? What if he had ample supplies? What, even, even if he had uh, some number, maybe even a thousand other brave astronauts there with him attempting to farm and, uh, and stay alive in a situation of kind of unexpected stranding? And, um, and what if the greenhouses were even much, much larger, such as these incredible greenhouses that uh, now exist in Holland and have the highest productivity? on a per area basis in the world. And it doesn't take very long to realize that it doesn't matter how big the greenhouses are, or how many people are there digging clods of earth and making potatoes, death on Mars for humans in such a situation is inevitable. 
like European geopolitics in the 1930s, survival in an environment as inherently hostile as the surface of Mars is not possible by simply extending an analogy with a rugged agricultural pioneer. <coughs> in fact, as we will see, food isn't even the first thing that makes sense to produce locally, given that food is actually pretty difficult to grow on Mars without a lot of related infrastructure. So the question I really have is, is how do we think about industry in space? So to kind of get into this, I'm going to start by talking a bit about Cody Reader. Who here has heard of Cody Reader? Cody Reader has one of the most incredible YouTube channels, Cody's Lab, certainly one of my favorites. And on this channel, he demonstrates the basis of a lot of primary production, including mining, farming, prospecting, and chemical purification of minerals, mostly derived from the area of his farm, which is in a reasonably remote part of Utah. But even a thousand Cody's, that is, healthy, knowledgeable, skilled experts, would not survive very long on Mars. While a thousand Cody's could probably make anything, they simply could not make everything faster than the rate at which it breaks down in normal use. And in fact, if you watch Cody's lab quite often, you'll know that simply keeping all the machinery that's necessary to keep his, his family's ranch operating in Utah, which has breathable air and access to supplies and water and, and uh, McMaster car, is actually pretty tough. And, um, and it's pretty obvious that, that his family has endured some, some tough times just trying to, trying to keep everything working. So it's simply not enough to grow some food. Living on Mars is, is more like living in a submarine than living in Utah, in that it will require automated manufacturing and, and lots and lots of metal. So re really when we think about autarky and self-sufficiency in Mars, we have to think big. We have to think really big. Now, this picture in the middle here is Australia's main steelworks, uh, known as Blue Scope, which employs about 16,000 people and produces 3 million tons of steel a year for the domestic market. And even a production at that level of 3 million tons of steel a year is probably not enough to sustain a city that's capable of, of autarky on Mars. So when we think about industrialization on Mars, we really need to think about factories on a gigantic scale. And on the right here, we have an image from the Tesla Gigafactory that makes cars and batteries. And, uh, and does so with, with really advanced automation and so on. But on Mars, we'll eventually need factories that make uh, microchips and advanced composites and, uh, and to carry out advanced industrial research. Again, the aim of this talk for me is not to be completely descriptive. Uh, rather, I feel like if you walk away from this talk with one new thought or one incisive, insightful question or one new strategy, then that's a good start. And that's my goal here. So... Just a quick aside here to kind of deal with a common bogeyman in this case. And that is, wouldn't it be nice if self-replicating machines existed? 3D printers are very exciting precisely because they offer a technological shortcut for certain kinds of manufacturing. But 3D printers are not self-replicating machines, not by a long shot. They require very uh, carefully curated inputs and they produce only a very narrow kind of outputs. Are self-replicating machines possible? Yes. Yes, of course. Given the right resources, biological organisms can reproduce themselves, including my favorite here, Mr. Platypus. But the platypus makes eggs that contain baby platypuses. And on the right here, E. coli produces E. coli, convincing E. coli to print a CPU or a platypus to lay an air filter would be something else. And so when we think of a self-replicating machine that can solve all the industrial problems that I've outlined, we're really describing a self-replicating factory or a process that can actually produce anything, which is nothing less than our modern globalized industrial society in total, at least until someone builds a matter compiler. And so we have to return to the original question, which is how to compactify the entire industrial stack and then ship it to Mars. Let's talk briefly about a division of labor and scale, because we really need to get a handle on, on what sort of scale we're talking here. Is this a big problem? Is this a big problem? Yes, it is. So here's a list of the 25 most populous countries on Earth. And the ones that I've marked in bold here, China, USA, 
Russia, Japan, Germany, and South Korea are the only ones that contain either a complete or very close to complete industrial stack. And the reason I put an asterisk next to Russia is that it doesn't anymore, although it did until quite recently. And South Korea does, but you have to bear in mind it's sandwiched between two others, Germany, as a, sorry, Japan and China. And, and Germany certainly does, but it is also kind of at the nexus or the hub of a series of other advanced, though not necessarily self-sufficient industrial nations in Europe. So these data here strongly suggest that a scale in the hundreds of millions is necessary to have enough labor specialization to support a complete industrial stack. And that's on a planet where we've evolved to survive. Launching 100 million people to Mars would be a major headache. So let's look at some counterexamples. Economically isolated countries such as Albania, Cuba, North Korea, or Iran have every reason to attempt industrial autarky, and in many cases, they've tried really, really hard. Yet even Cuba, with a population of 11 million people, a very benign climate and ample natural resources, has not succeeded. And my native Australia, with 22 million people, is not even close. I like to think that with further advances, it might be possible to achieve autarky on Mars with only a million people after 40 years of transport and building, but that would not be easy. For comparison, imagine taking Iceland in the year 2018, a country with 350,000 people. Without imports, Iceland would regress very rapidly to an 18th century standard of living within months or years. And now, given only unlimited money and a single container ship worth of gear, you have to think of a way to give Iceland complete autonomy and, and self-sufficiency. One container ship can carry about as much cargo as 2,000 flights of SpaceX's BFR. So it's a reasonable comparison. You have one container ship worth of gear. And you have to reproduce the industrial might of Japan, or the industrial versatility at the very least, by, say, 2050. And you have to do it without substantial population growth. It's almost unimaginable, and yet this is substantially easier than doing it on Mars, since in Iceland, at least, you, know, you can fish and breathe the air. It's not quite unimaginable. Let's talk a little bit about mechanization of labor and how to increase human productivity on Iceland or Mars by a factor of 100 or so. The trick is in the mechanization of labor, which is related to why whales have really big mouths. Consider a pre-industrial agricultural society, such as the fields pictured here on the bottom left. All the energy is solar power, derived from photosynthesis, and all available physical labor is from human muscle. Therefore, the total output of the system is limited, fundamentally, by how much energy all the humans can digest in their gut. Yet the gap in GDP between industrialized and pre-industrialized societies is a factor of between 30 and 60. By freeing themselves from the requirement of work, of sweat off the brow, a single human can control a gigantic machine, or even remotely program one, to perform labor on its behalf. We've already seen that while on Earth, a sufficiently motivated, knowledgeable individual can survive in many places with no resources whatsoever, an industrial Mars will require the production efficiency of 100 million humans, and a degree of labor specialization. The fundamental problem for industrial human society as the Mars is a terrible shortage of labor. Uh, so the solution is to automate, mechanize, and outsource all non-local tasks. But by how much? Consider the manual mechanized continuum graph. For any level of technology, there's an optimal blend of human and machine labor. Uh, as an example, a truck driver is uh, controlled by a human, but uh, most of the work is done by an engine, or a car assembler, or a general contractor. You know, consider the difference between the manual construction of the pyramids and the automated construction of the motherboard of a mobile phone. As technology improves, the optimal point uh, moves to the right towards mechanized, but it is never, never most efficient to completely automate something, even the construction of a moon or Mars base. A mixture of humans and machines is the way to go. Take, for example, these two drilling systems. On the left, you have the cheapest drill on Earth, which costs about 20 bucks, and on the right, the most expensive drill on Mars, which costs about 2 billion. Eight orders of magnitude more expensive, but the one on the right doesn't require a human to line it up. So how to go about doing a Japanese level of industrial versatility and power with an Iceland-style population? 
we must grow the fraction of labor that's automated as the base scales, as the base increases in population from very small numbers to very large numbers. So what does increasing individual productivity by three orders of magnitude look like? For inspiration, let's consider the development of programming languages. This approach is really only cost-effective in situations of profound labor shortage, uh, such as the problems that programmers faced in keeping up with the capability and complexity of modern computers in the face of the exponentially expanding capacity of computers as driven by Moore's law. As an example, there's some hierarchy of computer programming languages uh, from machine code at the very lowest levels uh, up to assembly, then uh, kind of low level uh, but more powerful languages such as C, and then C++, which enables kind of abstraction and templates. And then on top of that, you can have Python interpreted languages, which are more user friendly. Uh, and at each step, you know, there's, there's the interposition of another layer of abstraction between the human author and writer of the code and the bare metal operation, which allows for much more powerful things on the aggregate to be done. Although let's not stretch the analogy too much. So as we come to the close of this talk, and uh, alas, I do not have the time to go into the sort of detail I might like, I'd like to kind of cover um, or discuss at least the order in which the uh, industrial capacity or industrial capability on Mars would be rolled out uh, by considering this, this case study of a robot arm. So the question is, what resources uh, get made first on Mars? What, was, what supplies from Earth get, get transitioned to local production? Um, so this is the BCN3D Merveo open source robot arm. And here on the left is a, a table which contains most of the bill of materials. Uh, and broadly speaking, the components for a robot arm fall into five different types. We've got uh, structure, like the bones essentially, uh, fasteners, like screws and bolts, bearings, motors, which provide the force that moves them, and then power electronics, the, uh, the wires and the electronics that control the motors. And I've tabulated in this table um, the cost as a proxy for manufacturing difficulty and the mass as a proxy for transportation difficulty from Earth. And uh, while a workshop on Mars could obviously make any of these parts, local mass manufacture will proceed uh, in order of mass divided by difficulty manufacture, which is the above order. That is the dumbest mass, the stuff which is easiest to make locally, um, and the stuff which is heaviest gets made first. And that is structure, then fasteners, bolts, then bearings, ball bearings and things, then the motors, which although on Earth, they are cheaper due to mass production, uh, still quite difficult to make. They contain many heterogeneous metals and magnets and things like that. And finally, power electronics, computers, circuit boards, chips, uh, and, and intricate copper wiring. So with that in mind, let's get to the slide we were waiting for. This is what you've been waiting for. This is the roadmap for industrialization. There's a lot going on here. On the left of this graph, in the vertical co uh, colored columns, I've ranked successive orders of magnitude of industrial closure or local production capacity. That is, at the very bottom, everything is imported, and at the very top, all but one part in 10 to the 8 is, uh, is produced locally in terms of mass. Uh, and so as we kind of climb up this scale over time, uh, we start with producing oxygen lo locally, and then we obtain uh, local water and hydrogen and fuel, then some plastics and some food, and then concrete, masonry, uh, then structural metals such as iron and steel, then alloys, uh, and then uh, we move on to the kind of more fiddly um, uh, precision secondary manufacturing of electronics and appliances, advanced chemistry, uh, pharmaceuticals, and then processes and computers. And then on the horizontal axis, we have uh, population. So at the very left, we're at uh, 10 to the minus 1 humans, uh, well, robots, essentially, uh, in that bottom left square and then uh, the population increases by an order of magnitude with each step uh, up towards 100 million on the very right-hand side of this uh, graph. And so with local production of oxygen and fuel, uh, for the first time, humans are able to come to Mars and then fly home using uh, ISRU. Um, and in this kind of situation uh, with local production of, of limited, uh, some local uh, limited resource production, it would be possible to operate outposts on Mars, such as the Antarctic stations, uh, and here on the left, you have a picture of my wife at the South Pole, where she spent most of our engagement in 2016. Um, and the South Pole stations and, and other advanced and, and remote kind of uh, outposts of humanity are operated in this way with kind of very limited local population and very expensive ongoing requirements for resupply of basically everything, 
that, uh, in, in some ways, the, the high desert of Antarctica is, uh, is a more resource poor place than Mars, with the exception of the fact that the air is breathable. <clears throat> but at some point, uh, kind of along this, this graph, um, and, and one particular, one possible trajectory from, from kind of low population, low industrial sophistication to high population, high industrial sophistication is given by the red uh, trajectory, the red curve. Um, but at some point along this curve, vast quantities of cargo and humans will have to be shipped um, to kind of traverse this dangerous area. And, and the population between, say, 1,000 and, and uh, 100,000 or so is, is both too large to evacuate and, and too small to be adequate to provide for local self-sufficiency. And, and then, you know, uh, as one traverses this, this graph, um, the relative advantages in terms of industrial sophistication uh, come rather slowly as population increases, um, right up until I estimate the point where there's a fully diversified mining and uh, resource extraction um, kind of industry going on. And then after, at that point, most of the secondary manufacturing can be brought uh, within pressurized domes and, and, and uh, pressurized uh, volumes and, and done in kind of an automated manufacturing sense without additional investment in terms of uh, human capital uh, in operations that have to interface with the nasty and hostile Martian environment. Um, so the critical stage on this, the critical point really, is this cusp, cusp of settlement viability in purple, um, which is probably somewhere around 10,000 to 100,000 people. And at this point, the, the, the effect of diminishing returns drops off and, and kind of compounding advantages and improvements in technology um, mean that it gets easier and easier. But we still have to get to that point to begin with. The fundamental limit here on this graph is the Earth to Mars cargo capacity, which is really uh, kind of fundamentally determined by the rate at which we can build and recycle really, really gigantic rockets. And today, SpaceX can build about 20 Falcon 9 cores a year, uh, which is not very much, quite frankly, uh, when compared to the, the volume of material needed for a project like this, which is on the order of a million tons of cargo. Um, but Boeing this year is producing 560 737s a year, and that's kind of the scale that we need to be thinking about for this. So it is a tractable problem. It's tractable with, within the capabilities of the industry today on Earth. So, in summary, I think autarky on Mars is possible. It requires a level of kind of technological and industrial ambition that is not often talked about in this area. And it requires scale. It requires giant rockets. It requires lots of people. It requires uh, very, very advanced robots and advanced research in that area. It requires consistent help on Earth for many, many decades. It requires a lot of money. Not necessarily infinite quantities of money, but, but a steady commitment in terms of resources. And... Uh, I would love to take your questions, but um, alas, I am not with you today. But uh, perhaps you can uh, shoot me a, a question on Twitter. My handle is uh, at CJ Hanmer in the bottom right there. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.